Hi everyone, we will be going over Unit 5, Chapter 4, where we will be discussing animal diversity or all of the diversity within Kingdom Animalia. So Kingdom Animalia is incredibly diverse. It involves organisms that are microscopic, um, very, very small, like a flea, all the way up to the great blue whale, the largest organism on Earth. So very big diversity of form and size. But every single one of these organisms, whether we're talking about a sea sponge or a great blue whale, is going to be multicellular with different tissue structures. All of these organisms are heterotrophic. They rely completely on gaining energy from consuming organic material. And all of them have movement. But wait, we said a sea sponge was an animal. It, I don't really think about sea sponges as getting up and walking around. But their larvae are able to free, uh, free swim. They're free swimming larvae. So they are modal at some point in their life cycle, even if the adults are sessile. All right, other features. Most animals are diploids, and we use that word most because there are some exceptions. The gametes are going to be haploid. A gamete, remember, is an egg and a sperm, and when an egg and a sperm join together, we end up with a zygote. After karyogamy, these two join together to create a true diploid cell, which can develop into an adult individual. Um, the offspring are going to go through distinct developmental stages with a fixed body plan, which means the morphology of that animal is determined by the time this happens. Um, so, for instance, the butterfly here does not really reflect the larval stage, and it goes through some sort of metamorphosis at some point in its life cycle, and so the adult looks very different, but we are still following a fixed body plan with developmental cues, this being one of them. Other organisms like the grasshopper here, the nymph looks very similar to the adult, just smaller, um, still going through distinct stages. The reproduction of most animals is sexual, which is reflective of these most animals are diploids. The, there are some exceptions though. Many of these animals have a backup life cycle that is asexual. Imagine if the environment is stressful or you can't find a mate, you still want to be able to produce offspring asexually. For example, the nadarian, like this hydra, can reproduce by budding, meaning a little branch will grow off of the edge of it, and that branch can eventually break off, developing into two exact clones. The planarian here, which is a flatworm, um, does something that's almost really scary. It reproduces by something called fragmentation, which the starfish and the hydra can do as well, but the planarians kind of bring it to an extreme. The planarians, if you cut them in half, will develop into two exact copies. They won't die. Even the copy without the head will still develop into a complete clone. In fact, if I cut it again, I will get four clones. If I cut it again, I will get eight clones. If I cut it again, I will get more and more clones. In fact, I could put this planarian into a blender and end up with thousands of clones. So don't do that. Another version of asexual reproduction is parthenogenesis, but it's similar in sexual reproduction because we actually produce genetically unique individuals, but we do run the risk of building up mutations because this is kind of a self-fertilization. So let's talk about parthenogenesis. Some of these individuals can reproduce on their own, such as these grasshoppers, but you might notice that not every species can reproduce via parthenogenesis. For instance, Californicum will reproduce sexually, whereas Shepardi will reproduce with parthenogenesis, or it can reproduce with parthenogenesis if conditions are stressful. Uh, so that's a unique little evolutionary step that distinguishes it from it, its sister species, because during times of stress, this organism will still be able to make offspring. Now, bees do the same thing. They undergo parthenogenesis, but not due to lack of mate availability. They do this as part of their social structure. So the female diploid bee 
aka the queen, is the only bee that reproduces. And she reproduces with these uh, male bees. They will produce sperm. So these drone bees will produce sperm. But the only diploid individual is the female diploid bee. So what we're going to end up with is other diploid females when we produce sexually. Other than that, the queen still reproduces. She just reproduces on her own without the males. And what we will get is drones or worker bees. So they are haploid and uh, these uh, worker bees are going to be haploid and sterile or they're going to be the drones that can sexually re reproduce with only with the queen. Now, what exactly is parthenogenesis? Well, parthenogenesis is a way of self-fertilization. Uh, sexual reproduction, as a review, we end up with an egg and a sperm, which are both haploid. They join together in fertilization and develop into a diploid individual. There are two main kinds of parthenogenesis. There's haploid parthenogenesis, where we have a single oocyte, which will grow and develop into a haploid individual. Now, it depends on the species, but parthenogenesis can produce male and female individuals, depending on the species. Now, there's also diploid parthenogenesis. Diploid parthenogenesis, ugh, diploid parthenogenesis involves either self-fertilization or no fertilization, so automixes or apomixes. Still involving an oocyte, we have undergone meiosis to develop a single haploid oocyte. Now that oocyte could fuse with another ready-to-go oocyte, developing into a diploid individual. This individual will be genetically unique from the parent it is not a clone, it's genetically unique. Or this oocyte could just sort of duplicate itself, okay, duplicate all of its genetic material and still develop into a diploid individual, which is still genetically unique. Then there is apomixes, where we don't undergo meiosis, we undergo mitosis and start out with a diploid egg and that diploid egg will develop into a diploid individual. All of these methods involve the female parent. We're, we can only do this with an oocyte or an egg cell. We're not going to be able to have males reproducing on their own, only the females. All right, what happens once that sperm joins with the egg? Well, we end up with a zygote, a diploid zygote. And that diploid zygote upon fertilization will almost instantaneously start dividing. Um, it will divide and divide and divide, which is called cleavage. And we end up with this circle of cells, usually like eight to 10 cells. We still call this a zygote, it's still a zygote, but it's at the eight cell stage. Past the eight cells, we're gonna continue to divide but they're no longer going to be perfect stem cells. They're going to uh, create this hollow blastula. So we're continuing to divide and divide, but now the inside is no longer being filled with cells. The inside is kind of hollow. We call this a blastula. Then one side of it starts to dip inward and it creates this uh, hole right here, which we call the blastopore because it's a pore for the blastula, but this is actually called the gastrula. The gastrula is very unique because now these cells are starting to become differentiated, whereas these are perfect stem cells. If I took one of these, I could, could create a perfect clone of a whole individual. But at this stage, I can no longer do that because the outside layer is now dedicated to something called ectoderm, ecto meaning outside. And this inside layer right here is now dedicated to being endoderm. Some individuals will start to create a third type of germ layer called mesoderm, which will actually form in the middle here in this empty space. So not all animals do this, but most bilateral animals do. So let's talk about bilatera. So the parazoa, different than protozoa, parazoa are animal adjacent. These are your sea sponges. They have no true symmetry. They do have different 
cells, different cell types, but no true tissues. All the cell types are just kind of mixed in. So there's no way that I could cut this. There's no perfect line that I could cut to get an exact mirror image. So these are called parazoa or asymmetrical. And our main example of this are sea sponges. Other than that, we have eumetazoa or true animals that have distinct tissues and symmetry. The first kind is radiata. So they have radial symmetry. And the best example of this is nidaria or jellyfish and sea anemones. It doesn't matter how I cut this. I can cut it down the middle in any direction and I will get an exact uh, mirror image called radial symmetry. But other organisms, bilateralia, are bilateral symmetry, meaning I can only make one cut down the middle. I couldn't cut it this direction. I can only cut it one way down the middle, and I have two mirror images, and usually some sort of cephalization, usually cephalization, not always. Cephalization means we created a head, which usually includes sensory organs and a brain. All right, going back to the gastrula, we're talking about the gastrula. There are different types of tissues within the gastrula. We already talked about ectoderm, ecto meaning the outside, endoderm, endo meaning the inside, and mesoderm, meso meaning the middle. And the mesoderm develops kind of in this open space in the middle here. What does that mean? Well, radiata animals or animals with radial symmetry are mostly going to be diploblastic, meaning they only have two germ layers, the ectoderm and endoderm, whereas bilateral animals are almost always triploblastic. They're going to have three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Well, what does that mean? Well, endo meaning the inside. This is going to be your inner digestive tract organs, your stomach, your, um, your trachea and lungs, your esophagus, your intestines. This is all going to develop in your endoderm. And this blastopore is either going to be the mouth or the anus. It just depends on which type of animal we're talking about, whether the mouth forms first or the anus forms first. And we can talk about that later, but it's part of the digestive tract. So endoderm should be very easy to remember. Endo meaning inside your body. Mesoderm, middle. This is going to be all of your muscle, bone, and cartilage, even blood which makes sense because blood is formed inside of your bone. This also includes your visceral organs other than your digestive system and lungs, so your liver and other things. Lastly, we have ectoderm, ecto meaning outside. This is going to be your epithelium, the outer epithelium. So your skin, anything on your body surface that's not part of your digestive tract. And interestingly enough, this also forms your nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. Now that sounds wild, but it makes sense because your uh, ectoderm will actually dip and then close in, creating a hollow tube down the middle, which will eventually become the brain and the spinal cord in animals that have spinal cords. All right, um, here we can see a different diagram of diploblast versus triploblast, where we have the endoderm and ectoderm, but there is a non-living layer or basically a hollow layer in the diploblastic animals and mesoderm fills this hollow hole in the triploblastic. Now, what about that blastopore? We said that sometimes it's a mouth and sometimes it's an anus. It just depends on what type of animal we're talking about. Protostomes are mouth first. Proto meaning first, the prototype. So these organisms, this would, blastopore would become the mouth, the mouth opening. And then if the organism develops further, this hole at the end will become the anus. So this whole tract covered in endoderm is going to be your digestive tract here. Deuterostomes, deutero meaning mouth second, deutero meaning two. This actually means that this hole is going to be the anus. And then as the mesoderm develops, the hole at the other end will become the mouth. 
interestingly enough, we are deuterostomes. You and I, our anus developed first uh, before our mouth. So interesting little coincidence there. Oh, I already wrote it in there. Mouth first, mouth second. There we go. All right. Now, what do these different germ layers mean? Well, we already mentioned that some of these organisms are going to have like a hollow area in this mesoderm area. Um, and that can end up being a column or a hollow body cavity. A columates do not have a body cavity. That means the mesoderm is filled with tissues. An example of this is the platyhelminth or the flatworm. Here we have a picture of a flatworm, a columate. If I take a slice down the middle, the flatworm is going to look very flat and it's going to have all three layers without any body cavity on the inside. So A meaning not, no column, no body cavity. There's also something called a pseudocolumate, pseudo meaning false. There is a body cavity, but it's not a true body cavity. And it's usually used um, for movement or hydrostatic movement. This is very important for the animal. And our example here is nematodes. Sometimes nematodes are described as a tube within a tube because they have a complete digestive tract. So they have a complete hole going all the way through the worm. And that hole is surrounded by this body cavity. Um, so here the column is formed partially by the mesoderm and partially by the endoderm or the um, column here, the pseudocolum is in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. Whereas a true colomate, you colomate, have a complete colum that is completely surrounded by mesoderm. It does not touch the endoderm. The body cavity is just open inside of the mesoderm. And our example of this are annelids like earthworms or segmented worms and most other higher animals. All right, which animals are we gonna be talking about today? We already talked about some examples of different um, bodies, uh, body types like bilateralia or radiata. We're going to be talking about all of those, but we're going to be talking about nine um, major phyla. So we're going to talk about arthropods, nematodes, platyhelminths, which are flatworms. We're also going to be talking about annelids, which are segmented worms, mollusks like snails, clams, and um, uh, octopi, octopi and squid, cephalopods. We're also going to be talking about chordata quite a bit. Okay, this is all vertebrates. It's a pretty big one. Um, we're going to talk about echinodermata, which interestingly enough are closely related to chordates. They are both deuterostomes. Remember, that means second mouth. So the anus forms first in the gastrula. We're also going to be talking about jellyfish. Nadaria is the jellyfish and sea anemone family. And um, honestly, my favorite, porifera, sea sponges. I didn't mean to X that out. I meant to underline it. Um, so which phylum do you think is the most diverse, meaning which one has the most uh, different species? Is it sea sponges? Is it mollusks? Remember that includes clams, snails, and cephalopods. Or is it chordates, like anything with a vertebrae? Well, actually, it's going to be arthropods. Arthropods are incredibly successful. They have many, many, many diverse species. This includes insects and crustaceans. So you can see, um, and arachnids. So you can see that there's lots and lots and lots of different types of insects. Mainly insects uh, make this up, but also crustaceans. Uh, Chordata has quite a few, but Chordata is um, not nearly as many as Arthropoda. All right. Let's talk about these different species. You can click on this image to get to an interactive. And if you hover over each one of these um, phyla or subphyla, you can discover information about them, some examples, whether they're proteostomes, triplobastic, bilateral, how they reproduce. This is all testable material. 
Um, and if you click right here, these are the nine major phyla that we're going to go over. We're going to go over Porifera, Nidaria, Annelida, Mollusca, Nematoda, Platyhelminths, Echinodermata, Arthropoda, all of the subphyla of Arthropoda, and the vertebrates or chordata and these major subphyla of chordata. So we're going to be going over all of these individually, but don't forget this is an incredibly helpful interactive that kind of summarizes all the information that we're going to go over today. All right, let's continue here. Starting out with phylum porifera. Again, I think just think this is one of the more interesting ones. They do not have any type of symmetry. Um, the word porifera means pore bearing. These are your sea sponges. So the bath sponge that you use in your house um, is could be a sea sponge. Many sponges now are synthetic, but your original like loofah or I'm sorry, a loofah is actually a, a gourd. Um, these sea sponges can be the kind that you use in the bath. Um, they developed over 580 million years ago, so very, very, very uh, ancient type of animal. And there are different types of sea sponges that have different types of skeletons. Yes, I did say skeleton. Um, your common sponge that you might use is a demo sponge. Um, it has a sponge and fibrous skeleton, so really great for the bath, as opposed to a silica skeleton, a skeleton, which is kind of like glass, which would not work out really well in the bathtub. All right, now, what do I mean by skeleton? Well, they do have a rudimentary skeleton made out of these little sclerocytes. They could be made out of silica. They could be made out of um, other types of um, fibers just to help hold its shape. Now, there are other types of tissues within each of these little colonies of the sponge. The sponge basic body plan is to pull in water, and when it pulls in water, it is going to absorb nutrients. It's going to absorb nutrients by these amoeba sites. Sometimes the uh, pinocytes can phagocyte some um, material, but mainly the amoeba sites are going to be delivering nutrients to all of these different kinds of specialized cells within the organism's tissues. It does have sperm and ovum that it can just kind of release into the ocean, um, but it also has these kaonocytes. The kaonocytes have little flagella that help to wave and kind of pull water in from the outside environment. And the water is going to uh, move out and up through the osculum, osculum, I'm sorry, the osculum. And when it's pulling that water through these pores or the porocytes, it will be absorbing the nutrients and the oxygen that it needs. So it's kind of siphoning that water up and out through the top of the sponge. All right, phylum Nidaria. Nidaria sounds really cool. It is the jellyfish and sea anemone. Nidaria is named after the nidocyte. The nidocyte or nematocyst is going to be a stinging cell. These are specialized cells that are only found in the nidarian family. So both jellyfish and sea anemones have this. And it's a touch sensitive little barb. When the barb touches something, it will eject a second barb. Um, that will uh, attach into the organism that is stinging, releasing a little bit of venom. And depending on the type of jellyfish or the type of nadaria, this could be a very severe or very mild. Um, the hydrozoans or class hydrozoa includes the Portuguese man o' war, which can be extremely venomous. The uh, ski <laughs> cyphozoa is your true jellyfish when you think of a jellyfish. Um, you have sea anemones and corals in this family in the anthozoa, and then you have box jellyfish also, um, so cubozoa. Now, they have an interesting body plan. They have a gastrovascular cavity, so their blood and gastric and everything is all in this one open cavity. It only has one opening to the outside, which is on the underneath of the jellyfish. It would be on the top of the sea anemone on the polyp right here. Um, but this is just one opening, so the mouth and the anus is the same opening. 
And it also has a very rudimentary nerve system called the nerve net, and it literally looks kind of like a net. This is not an advanced nervous system. They don't think or really feel. What the nerve net helps to do is organize its motion, that pushing motion, to kind of cause it to push the water out from its canopy at the same time. So it's just there for organizing motion. Now, Nidaria have an interesting life cycle. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. Um, they are going to release sperm and egg just into the ocean, out into the wild, and maybe it will find a partner, maybe not. That zygote can develop into a larva, which will then attach to the ocean floor, forming a polyp. Now, if we're talking about a sea anemone, the sea anemone will stay at the polyp stage. But if we're talking about a jellyfish, then it will continue to develop into an adult ephytra and eventually into the medusa form. So this is your classic medusa form right here um, if we're talking about a jellyfish. But if we're talking about sea anemones, they just kind of stay like this. Um, now, sea anemones actually um, are not sessile. I used to think that they are. They can actually detach and move. It's not very, they don't do that very often though. But still, um, they can reproduce sexually or asexually. And um, they are going to be either jellyfish or sea anemones. All right, quick question. Okay, I was going to ask you a quick question, but it was not behaving with me. I was going to ask you, what do you think that symbol represents, this symbol? Well, that is a medical symbol called the um, codicus, 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 and it usually looks like a snake kind of wrapped around a stick, um, usually one or two, and they are representing many medical corps. Um, such as the Navy Medical Corps or Public Health Service. Sometimes you see the codicus um, in the hands of Mercury, the god, but that's not what we're talking about today. So actually, this is a representation or most likely is a representation of a type of parasite removal. Let's see, I think I have a picture of it. Here you can see the guinea worm. The guinea worm is going to infect these individuals due to contaminated water. And one of the earliest medical treatments is to take a match or a stick and slowly wrap the guinea worm. These guinea worms can become very, very, very long. Wrap it around the stick and slowly pull. You don't wanna to pull too fast because the worm will break in half um, and then it might get infected but you're going to slowly pull this organism out. And these people, they get it by drinking contaminated water, drinking water, and the uh, worms will move from the stomach into the blood and then kind of settle underneath the skin. Um, and that's when people develop these ulcers that the worm is kind of sticking out of the skin and that's when they will wrap it up. So there is an intermediate life cycle through a copepod vector um, that will um, consume the larva and then start that life cycle over again. So drinking clean water is very important. But let's talk about nematodes. Nematodes are also known as round worms. They are that tube within a tube structure. Here you can see a microscopic um, nematode. They normally are very small and clear, but some of them like the C. elegans can get very, very large. One of the reasons why C. elegans is very commonly studied by scientists is because it is very large. They do have a complete digestive system that both ends will be tapered to a point. There is a true mouth and a true anus and the digestive system goes all the way through. Um, and these are your um, pseudocolomates. They are going to have that tube within a tube uh, structure. They do have a nerve, um, nerve cords, not really a brain or any nerve, a nervous system, but they do have nerve cords running 
um, along their body, again, to help coordinate movement and find food. So they do have a ganglia, not a brain, but an area of dense nervous tissue that can help them navigate the world around them. Many, many, many species of nematodes are parasitic. Um, and some of those parasitics uh, can cause pretty bad disease. Some of them not so much, like the pinworm, which is a nematode, causes itchiness and usually is found in children. Um, but others like the guinea worm can cause some problems. And you may be familiar with the heartworm disease, which I also have a picture of here. Um, you can see that this um, pet, probably a dog died from heart disease um, due to an infection with this nematode called heartworms, which is transferred by the bite of a mosquito. Um, so always use your pet preventative to prevent this from happening to your pet. All right, next, platyhelminths. Platyhelminths are called flatworms um, due to their flat shape. They are limited in size because they do not have a respiratory system. And so they will be flat due to um, using their skin surface area as diffusion of oxygen. But they do consume nutrients. Um, and they have something called flame cells, which help to uh, get rid of waste. So let's see, I do believe that I have some pictures here. Uh, flatworms or platyhelminths come in uh, different shapes. So there are tapeworms, which are segmented worms. Um, they form in repeating segments, and then the top segment will have some sort of uh, attachment um, with lots of little hooks. It looks like a head, but it's not really a head. Um, it doesn't have a brain. It's just another repeating segment that has like these little hooks on the end of it. And these are parasitic. Um, we also have uh, the flukes or bloodworms. These are also parasitic. Um, but then we have these flatworms, which can be free living. And they come in all these beautiful shapes and sizes. They can actually be pretty um, beautiful, but they can also be really um, dangerous. So there's a hammerhead flatworm, which is poisonous and kind of immortal. So don't kill it by trying to squish it or cut it because it'll just grow back. Here is the basic body plan of a flatworm. We do have an eye spot, not a true eye, but the eye spot is on top of the cerebral ganglia, another like dense area of nervous tissue. One of the distinct things about the flatworms is that they have a ladder-like nervous system. Their nervous system is two-sided. We have two main nerves um, connected by these rungs of nervous tissue, so these transverse nerves. They also have an interesting digestive system. They have a pharynx, which acts as their mouth and anus. This is on the underneath of their body, and they can actually extend it out of their body, kind of like a mouth. Um, but they're also going to have this extremely branched digestive system. And so food particles will like go to the end of these branches and get absorbed. And then the flame cells will help to push the waste out of their excretory canals. So they can push nitrogenous waste out of their body this way, but larger waste will have to come back out of their mouth anus. Um, so again, we have your free living flatworms, your parasitic flatworms, your flukes, and then your tapeworms. Let's see, here is the life cycle of a tapeworm. Um, we are going to uh, get infected by eating uncooked pork or uncooked meat. This is the pork tapeworm, which can be pretty aggressive. The top of it is going to have the scolex, which is not a head. It's like this little place with lots and lots of little hooks. This is what's going to attach into your intestinal lining and allow this uh, organism to grow and consume your nutrients that you're eating. All right, another type of worm is the annelid family. Annelids are known as segmented worms. Annelids are incredible. They have a complete digestive system, a true nervous system, and a closed circulatory system, and they are true colomates. Um, so they do have a true body cavity. So this is one of our more advanced 
uh, animals, these segmented worms, which includes earthworms, leeches, and these fan worms. So let's talk about the Annelida. Um, Annelida are going to reproduce sexually, but they are hermaphroditic, so they can fertilize each other with cross fertilization. Hermaphroditic organisms do not normally self fertilize. That would be called parthenogenesis, maybe. Um, but these guys are actually going to cross fertilize with each other. So they're both male and female, but the male female will impregnate the other male female. Um, they do have a mouth and an anus on opposite ends with a pharynx, esophagus, and their crop and gizzard, which is kind of like their stomach. They consume a little bit of dirt, which helps to break down food particles as they move around with their musculature. It kind of breaks down those food particles to allow the food go into their true digestive system. They do have a closed circulatory system with five hearts, um, kind of in this circular pattern, close to the mouth and then true blood vessels throughout their body. They also have a nervous system with a rudimentary brain um, and the nervous system is highly branched with I believe two main nerve cords running down either side of the body. Um, and they do have an interesting reproductive system. Like I mentioned, they will cross fertilize. So the sperm of one will impregnate the other at the same time. And here you can see an image of them fertilizing each other. Now the clitellum is going to be kind of like a little egg sac. It will move down the body and then be uh, released or actually maybe up the body and then be released. But that is not a permanent part of their body. It's just for reproduction. And this is an image of a um, another type of segmented worm, a parasitic segmented worm. Oh my gosh, I forgot the name of leeches. Ah, I forgot the name of leeches. So um, we have the earthworms, feather, uh, feather duster worms, and then leeches here. And leeches are parasitic. They're going to have hooks in their head, which allow them to attach to their host and then drink their blood. So that's leeches. Segmented worms are cool. Um, mollusca. Mollusca is one of the most diverse um, phyla here, one of the major phyla. Not as diverse as, as arthropoda, but you can see we have snails, slugs, clams, mussels, and even cephalopods. Cephalopods deserve their own honorable mention, but I'm not going to talk about them today because I could spend all day talking about them. Highly intelligent. Um, they can problem solve. They can change color. They have complex social interactions. Cuttlefish can actually change their gender. Um, very, very interesting. Cephala meaning head and poda meaning foot, head foot. Um, very interesting animals. Their foot, whereas the snail and the slug, you can see they're, they're moving on this major foot. And even the mollusks here, the mussels and the clams, they have a major foot as well. But the cephalopod is a modified foot that creates kind of a funnel that they can expel water through a jet stream, which is how they move. And then the edges of the foot are going to encircle that cone shape and then um, act as arms. So it's a completely modified foot there. But we also have snails, slugs, clams, and oysters. Um, here is a nautilus. It is a part of the mollusca family. Here we have a cuttlefish, a squid. You can see it blending into its environment there, and a, a blue ringed oct octopus, which is actually highly poisonous. Um, so don't touch them if you run into them in the wild. Um, here we can see the basic body plan of a snail or a slug. Uh, inside of the mouth is going to be a specialized organ called the radula. And this is also in clams. It is like a little sharp teethy tongue that they use to grind up their food. 
Um, this is the visceral mass, which is going to have all of your organs and intestines and digestive system. But on the outside of the visceral mass is going to be the mantle. And the mantle is responsible for secreting the shell. So whether we're talking about um, a snail or a clam, they're still going to have a mantle, which is going to um, secrete a calcium based shell. Um, the slugs don't do this, but the others do. Even cephalopods have a mantle, but the cephalopod mantle mm, does not um, produce that calcium. It does produce kind of a thick skin layer, but it is modified, so it doesn't do the same. Uh, it doesn't create that hard outer shell. Um, here we can see a clam. We can still see the big foot um, that is characteristic of mollusca. Um, here we have the foot region, and they can actually stick the foot outside of their shell if they need to, to move around. And they do have a mouth separate from their anus. Um, so very interesting little creatures here. And here they, you can see the mantle that is going to produce this outer shell. Now, they are all going to have gills. Even land snails are going to have gills to help them breathe. Uh, so they need to um, have availability to oxygen. And then your land snails are going to have modifications to help keep this moist to allow for the most absorption of oxygen as possible. Very interesting uh, family. Now, arthropoda. We already said that arthropods are the most diverse. This is going to include centipedes, scorpions, beetles, arachnids, insects, um, in any crustacean. And they all have a specific body plan. They're going to have a segmented body um, with hinged joints and an exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton is going to be divided into the head, thorax, and the abdomen. So they're going to have those three distinct types. Now there are five major phyla. We have the uh, trilobites. Trilobites are ancient um, types of arthropods, but they fit all the characteristics. They have a segmented exoskeleton made out of chitin. So chitin is um, a very important part of, of the arthropod family because all of these exoskeletons are going to be made out of chitin. Um, we also have arachnids. Arachnids include scorpions and ticks and spiders and um, uh, a whip spider or whip scorpions and tarantulas. Tarantulas are uh, similar to arachnids, but not quite. Um, so we have arachnids. We also have millipedes and centipedes in the Miropoda class. Um, we may all be familiar with the centipedes. I know I played with them when I was little. Um, they have many, many legs. That is the characteristic of Miropoda is many, many legs. Some of them can be quite venomous, like the um, millipede here. Uh, don't play with those. They, their bites do not feel good. Um, this one is actually pretty commonly found in the house, a little Miriapoda there. All right, we also have crustaceans. Crustaceans in their own right are very incredibly diverse. We have lobsters, shrimp, um, mantis shrimp, crabs. Then we have barnacles and copepods. Um, these are also crustaceans. And then brine shrimp, which are kind of its own little thing, um, which are very important for the ocean ecosystem. All right, last but not least, we have hexapoda. Hex meaning six, poda meaning foot, so six legs. This includes fleas, walking sticks, ants. Any insect, beetle, or bug that has six legs is going to be in hexapoda, the six-leg family. 
All right, um, just a little side mention. I don't think that there's any questions on the test about this, but I find it very, very interesting. Horseshoe crabs are actually very closely related to arachnids. They have some of these similar characteristics, but one unique thing about them is that their blood is actually blue. They gather in these huge groups on the beach during their mating season, and so perfect opportunity for humans to come snatch them up because they're all gathered in these large groups, and then they bleed them of their blood. Uh, which is blue because it create uh, it has copper based uh, hemocyanin and we have iron based hemoglobin but the heme is what carries oxygen throughout its body we use this blue blood in um, the biomedical industry to detect endotoxins and other things we mix it with um, different medical treatments to kind of detect different things inside of it. I am not a biomedical expert, but I find it very, very interesting. And then once we have drained them of their blood, we send them back on their way out into the ocean. Very, very interesting. And they're very similar to actually uh, arachnids because they also have the book lungs and they have eight legs like the arachnids do. Now, arthropodas have interesting circulatory systems. They have what's called an open circulatory system. So they have hemolymph, which is similar to blood, but not quite. It's going to be open in their body cavity and bathe their internal organs directly. They don't have blood vessels except for their heart, which is all along the outside here. Here is the heart here, and it will pump and cycle blood into this body cavity um, with its small pumps. But the pumps don't stay in a closed system. They just kind of dump out into the body system and create this open circulatory system. They also have unique respiratory systems. Most insects are going to have a tracheal system. A tracheal system just means an opening in the side of their body or tracheal tubes with these spiracles on the end of it. So the trachea part is the hole in the side of the exoskeleton that is open to the air and the spiracles will carry that air deeper into their body. Um, most insects have the tracheal system. The arachnids are going to have something called a book lung, which is actually very, very similar to gills. And the book lung has like a thick outer layer and then pages, which are the gills on the inside. So we call them book lungs. Other um, crustaceans will actually have gills. So crustaceans, depending on what they are, will have gills. Let's see, I passed up the crustaceans here. Um, many of these crustaceans have gills. It just depends on the species. Now, they do have a true nervous system, but the nervous system varies so much species by species. Um, they are going to have highly specialized sensory organs. So that's one thing that is unique about arthropoda. Um, they don't just have eyes, they have antenna as well. It just depends on the species. Many of them have multiple eyes, more than two eyes, and then they have these specialized sensory organs. They also, if they do have eyes, will have compound eyes, which are really not great at distinguishing specific objects but really great at distinguishing movements. So it helps them to get away from predators very quickly. Um, so really interesting nervous systems. Um, they are, tend to be pretty simple throughout the body, but then in the cephalization, in the head part of the organism, since they have those specialized mechanoreceptors and specialized antenna, that part of the nervous system will be highly developed. All right. Uh, reproductive system is really um, unique to the species, but they're going to go through distinctive developmental stages. For instance, the uh, mosquito will lay eggs in the water and the mosquito larva will be free floating or free swimming in the water. And it actually has this little mouth that goes above the water while the rest of their body hangs out under the water. Once it pupates, it literally hatches from its pupa directly into the sky and begins flying around. 
So a very distinctive life cycle. Not all insects go through distinctive life cycles though. A metabulus or without um, metamorphosis, their nymph stage looks exactly like their adult stage. It just gets bigger. Um, so the nymph and the juvenile and the adult just look like bigger versions of the nymph stage. Then we have hemimetabulus, which means partially metamorphosis, where we have these instars. The um, larval stage or the nymph stage looks very similar to several instars, but then the final adult form is going to be unique. Then we have holometabulus, entirely metamorphosized, much like your butterfly and many of these flying insects, they their pupa or their egg and pupa will look completely different than the adult and they have to go through some sort of metamorphosis pupa stage. So again, metabulus means metamorphosis. A means not. So A metabulus means no metamorphosis. Metabulus, hemi means partial. So partial metamorphosis. Hollow means whole. So whole metamorphosis. Um, here are some other examples of the larva of different types of um, like the tadpole shrimp, the barnacle larva, or this green crab larva. So you can see this doesn't look very much like a crab right now, um, but it will when it becomes an adult. So very distinctive developmental stages in their reproduction. Echinodermata. Echinodermata. Echino means spiny and dermata means skin. So we're talking about spiny skin. Your sea urchins, brittle stars, sea stars, um, and even these um, sea lilies and sea cucumbers are part of the phylum Echinodermata. Um, they are very known for their hydraulic um, or their water vascular system. So they actually use ocean water to carry oxygen inside of their body as their vascular system. And it also helps them to move around because they can actually move these spines and move these arms by pumping water into their limbs. They also move around on something called tube feet. On the underside of this sea star are going to be many, many, many little tube feet sticking out and they can also move those tube feet around. Um, they're usually not great at walking around and moving, but they do move. And interesting enough, these are deuterostomes, so mouth second deuterostomes. And they have a, an oral surface um, and an arboreal surface, meaning that their mouth is on the underneath side. This is where they eat and their anus is on the top. So their um, waste will go out the opposite side as where their food goes in. Um, so very interesting. Um, let's see, here we have the basic body plan of a sea star. Uh, you can see these uh, digestive glands. They do have a complete digestive system. It's kind of interesting that the, the mouth and the anus are very close together, but the digestive system goes down in these branches. You also have gonads. In fact, the sea urchins are well known for uh, people eat the gonads of the sea urchins. Um, they're going to be also along the inside of these arms. And here you can see the top of the tube feet, the ampulla. This is where they kind of push water in and out um, on, into the podium, which allows these little tube feet to move around and attach to rocks. Um, so very, very interesting uh, organisms that are deuterostomes. All right, what about phylum chordata? So we've already talked about all of the invertebrates. Let's now talk about the vertebrates or phylum chordata. Uh, chordata or chordate means that they have some sort of notochord. Now we are not really gonna talk a whole lot about urochordata or cephalochordata. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about the vertebrata, true vertebrate animals. That's where we're gonna focus on. But just a happy mention, this is a hemichordata, um, which is closely related to those echinoderms. We're gonna go this direction. So just as a um, uh, overview, 
um, we are going to go through very similar developmental stages in every single chordate um, larva. They're all going to share these four characteristics. They have to have some, cordo, some sort of notochord, which is a rod-shaped structure that runs along the back. Sometimes this is only present in the embryo or in the uh, larval stage, and as an adult, it's no longer there. Um, but in true vertebrates, this is what's going to develop into their um, uh, vertebra. So the notochord will develop into the vertebra, not the brain, the vertebra. So in these rudimentary organisms, it's a hollow hydraulic tube that they can use to stiffen their body and move around and help them stay in the correct shape. It is developed from the epidermis. Um, and like I mentioned, when the epidermis develops, it kind of creates a little hole or a little dip. And then as that dip closes in on itself, it becomes that hollow notochord tube. Um, the dorsal hollow nerve cord is what's going to develop into the spinal cord in vertebrates, and they all have pharyngeal gill slits. Even you and I have pharyngeal gill slits during our embryonic development. They don't always stay there. Now, in higher vertebrates, these pharyngeal gills will develop into other parts of the body, such as your ear bones and tonsils. And all vertebrates, including you and I, have a post-anal tail, a tail that extends past the anus. All right, so here's what I was talking about. We have um, these gills, uh, these gill arches. For instance, in this shark, we have these gill arches um, that are going to develop into the osseum or these ear bones and also the hyoid bone and part of the jaw bone. So th these are going to develop into different structures as evolution occurs. Um, in fish, they're still going to be the gill arches. All right, so first, I said we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about cephalochordata and urochordata, so let's just get that out of the way real quick. Uh, urochordata includes the tunicates. They look like this as an adult, not very animal-like, not very vertebra-like. It looks more like an invertebrate animal. Um, and that is because as an adult, they don't reflect the vertebra, but as a larval stage, uh, this picture B right here is the larval stage of that same um, tunicate animal that includes the notochord and the dorsal nerve cord. So they do reflect uh, chordata as uh, juveniles. Um, their adults are filter feeders. They're, they can be solitary, as seen here, or they can be colonial, as in this picture. So here we see a very large colony. They're here attached to the ocean floor right here, and we just see stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of these urochordata, or these colonial tunicates. This particular one is called a salp. Um, and it is feeding on phytoplankton. They are going to be filter feeders. Um, then the lancelets, lancelets are named after their shape that looks kind of like a blade, very sharp, but they're actually pretty small. They usually bury themselves in the ground and they're what's called a suspension feeder, which is very similar to filter feeders, um, but they're going to be feeding on smaller food particles, very, very small food particles that are actually suspended in the water. Um, so not large particles that are floating around. And they very much reflect the urochordata um, larva. So they look very similar to that. They have a similar body plan. They have a notochord and the dorsal spinal cord, but they also have segmented muscles, which are persistent in larger fish. We see those segmented muscles in larger fish as well. Um, speaking of fish, fish are going to be aquatic animals that have fins and scales. So very um, developed uh, compared to the cephalochordatas here. 
Um, the fish are going to be filling all kinds of different niches, both predator and prey, both herbivores and carnivores, both uh, parasites and some filter feeders. They are all going to undergo sexual reproduction, but they can be fertilized internally or externally. So they don't have to copulate in order to reproduce. Um, some species just release their sperm. They do have bilateral body symmetry, which means they're going to be deuterostomes. Um, they are considered ectothermic or cold blooded, or they rely on their environment for their temperature. All right, so we are first. Fish is a huge section. All of these are fish right here, but first let's just go over hagfish and lampreys. So hagfish are eel shaped fish and most notably known for producing lots and lots and lots of slime. Um, humans will actually catch hagfish just to get a bunch of slime. Um, they can be used for leather, like a leather substitute, but mainly we use them for their slime. Um, they, they do have a skull, but no like vertebra. Um, they do have that notochord though. Um, the lampreys uh, are jawless fish, so these are agnathus, agnathus, mm, well, they have nathostomes here that have jaws, but agnathus means A, no jaws, agnathostomes. Um, they don't have a jaw, but they have all of these hook-like teeth that create this sucker pattern because these are very parasitic. They're going to attach to an organism and they're just going to live their life attached to that organism as long as they can. You may have seen these sticking on sharks. Um, that's one of their preferred hosts. They generally don't harm the host more than just uh, being a small irritant. All right, next let's talk about chondrichthyes. We're talking about your sharks, rays, and skates. Chondrichthyes, these are jawed fish. They're part of the nathostome family. Uh, chondrichthyes are going to be usually predatory. They do not have bones. They are not bony fish. They are cartilaginous, so they don't have bones, but they do have highly developed teeth. These are modified placoid scales. So they evolved these modified placoid scales. And you know that I love sharks. They are perfect. They are evolutionary winners. They have pretty much been unchanged for 400 million years. Very, very interesting features. They have a very, very good sense of smell, and they also have some interesting organs like the ampullae of Lorenzini, which detect electric fields or the movement of their prey. They also have something called the lateral line, uh, which detects vibrations in the water, but other fish have this too. But the ampullae of Lorenzini is really cool. It can detect electromagnetic fields. Um, so awesome animals. We also have uh, stingrays and skates. Um, they look very, very similar. The main difference is the location of this dorsal fin. Oh, that was supposed to be an arrow. The location of this dorsal fin here is a little bit different, but the skates and rays look and behave very similarly. All right, now let's talk about ray fin fish or bony fish. This family is called Actinopterygii. Actinopterygii are still jawed fish, but they have a bony skeleton. Their gills are covered by an operculum, which is a um, large uh, scale that helps protect the gills and they can actually lift the operculum to help pump water if need be, as opposed to the sharks and rays where their gills are exposed um, they also have something called a swim bladder, which can help with buoyancy, but their main characteristic here is the ray fins. Now here you can see the bony skeleton, you can see the ray shaped fin, and this is an image of the swim bladder. The swim bladder is not normally protruding out of the fish, it's normally inside of the fish, and it's actually quite an elegant organism or organ, because as the fish swims deeper, it puts more pressure on the swim bladder, which contains a little bit of air. And then that causes the air to be condensed because of that pressure. And so some of that air is put back into the fish's blood, meaning that it's able to stay buoyant at those deeper levels. 
as the fish swims up, less pressure is put on the swim bladder, so it expands, allowing it to be more buoyant at that higher level. This is entirely dependent, though, on moving slowly. This fish was probably caught in a deep sea fishing expedition. It got hooked and then came up to the surface very rapidly, meaning that the gases didn't have time to dissolve or get expelled, and so the swim bladder inflated very large, and this fish will die. Um, but I mean, I think it was already slated for death if it got caught uh, by a fisherman. All right, another very, very interesting subgroup, okay? Uh, they still have ray-shaped fins, but this subgroup that I wanted to talk about are called Cygnathidae. Cygnathidae, it literally means that their jaw, Nathan, has been fused together, so a fused jaw. And these are going to be your seahorses, your pencil fish, and your sea dragons. Sea dragons look very similar to seahorses, but seahorses swim upright. They have highly reduced fins. Their fins are very small. In fact, they're really not good swimmers at all, but they have a very strong tail. So what they're known for is grabbing onto branches and staying in those branches and swaying with the um, sea ocean, uh, the waves. Now, the sea dragon has taken this to an extreme, and their fins actually don't assist in swimming very much. They look very similar to the seaweed, which they grab onto. All of this family have a very unique reproductive mode termed male pregnancy. Now, the male produces sperm and the female produces eggs. But the difference is that the female actually has a phallic um, egg depository and the male has a small pouch and the female will deposit her eggs into the pouch and then the male will brood inside of its pouch until it gives birth, like this one looks like it's about ready to, and then he will spew out the offspring. Here is a short video about this. If you would like to go watch this video, um, it shows the seahorse mating ritual. So they do produce free swimming offspring from those eggs which were hatched inside of his pouch. Very interesting. They also um, have something called a bony ring, which means their ribs have kind of fused together in this ring shape. So also very unique. All right, now let's talk about Sarcopterygii. We talked about Actinopterygii, which is ray fin. Sarcopterygii are going to be your lobed fin fishes, like your coelacanth and your lung fishes. So here we can see these lobed fins. They have um, more projection, more bony projection, as opposed to these fish, which do not have a large bony projection. Um, the lobed fin fish also, as per the name, would develop lungs. So this is your first uh, group of organisms which have evolved the ability to breathe air, your lungfish. They're still tied to the ocean or to the water, but they can live in very thick, murky water because they can gulp air and, and breathe through their lungs. Um, so the coelacanth is also part of this. They have a very developed lobe fin. And these are going to be your intermediate between your um, tetrapods, between fish and tetrapods, or your four-legged amphibians. And the fossil uh, tiktolic, tiktolic is going to be your main indicator. This is a, an artist's rendition of tiktolic. It's in between a fish and an amphibian. It has the lobed fins and it has uh, rudimentary lungs. You can see the difference between your lobed fin fish and your tiktolic, if I'm saying that correctly. And this is a literal fossil of this organism, which leads us straight into talking about tetrapods. Tetrapod means four limbs, and so amphibians are going to be our first tetrapods that we talk about. Amphibians utilize something called cutaneous respiration, meaning that their blood vessels that in their closed circulatory system move very close to their skin. Their skin must remain moist to encourage as much gas exchange as possible. So they absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide through their skin and their skin will have these like pouches in them to help with more surface area and absorption. 
But some organisms, especially in their juvenile stages, are going to have external gills, um, these frilly external gills. Some organisms like axolotls retain these gills as adults, but if this tadpole grows into a salamander, it will actually have some rudimentary lungs. So some amphibians have lungs, but they need their skin plus their lungs to get enough surface area to absorb new, uh, oxygen. They are completely tied to the water. Though they are tetrapods and have a terrestrial life cycle, they have to lay their eggs in water. Their eggs cannot survive outside of the water. And their juveniles, known as tadpoles, are aquatic. They don't become terrestrial until their adult life cycle, and axolotls do not become uh, terrestrial at all. They just stay in the water. Um, they are ectothermic and rely on their environment for uh, warmth. So here are some different types of amphibians. Here you can see the frog skeleton. This is the vertebra up here. Their vertebra are actually pretty short, but they have this elongated hip. This is their ilium, their hip bone, and this allows them to be modified for jumping. So they have these strong jumping muscles, and this opens up kind of like a spring. Um, here you can see their aquatic life cycle versus their terrestrial adult life cycle, and then kind of the intermediate, this little tadpole with legs is when it starts to come out of the water. And this is going to be your general plan for most amphibians. These are the eggs that must stay in the water, and usually it's a numbers game. They're just going to lay as many eggs as possible and then maybe some of them survive because these eggs are also a tasty treat for other predators. There are several different types of amphibians. We're all familiar with frogs and toads, salamanders and newts, and the axolotl is part of the salamander family. It just never grows hind legs. It just kind of stays as a juvenile and it retains its external gills. Then there's also a type of amphibian that looks a lot like a worm, a Sicilian. Um, it is a legless amphibian, very worm-like, but it is amphibian. It breathes through its skin just like the amphibians do, and it has a uh, aquatic and a terrestrial life cycle. Very interesting organisms. Now let's talk about amniotes. Amniotes are our next uh, step where we can talk about reptiles, birds, and mammals. All of these have developed an amniotic membrane. In the case of reptiles and birds, that amniotic membrane is going to be inside of a, an egg, which may or may not have a hard shell. For reptiles, it's going to be like a leathery shell. Um, and then inside of that amniotic membrane is going to be a yolk, which allows this uh, embryo to develop much, much further than it would in the case of the amphibian. These amphibian eggs hatch very, very young or very developmentally um, young into these tadpoles, which really look very embryo-like. Whereas your reptiles, birds, and mammals have that amniotic sac, allowing them to develop further. Um, there are three different types of amniotes. We have synapses. Synapses have one temporal fenestra, okay? Other than their eye, we don't consider their eye. That's, that's the eye. We're gonna have one temporal fenestra and that includes mammals. So all mammals are going to have one little fenestra, including humans. Then we have anapsids, A meaning no, there's no fenestra, it's not there. This includes turtles. And then diapsid, di meaning two. So this, we have one, two, and this is dinosaurs and reptiles are going to have two temporal fenestra. And here I have some um, pictures. This is a turtle, uh, well, it looks like a um, fossilized turtle skull, and you see there's no fenestra right here. Here we see a mammal, um, a, a fossilized mammal. You can see the fenestra over here. And then we have, this is a modern snake and a chameleon. I thought that they were interesting because they have these um, big eye sockets, but then behind the eye sockets, we have two fenestra. Um, here we can see one of the fenestra and the other fenestra is kind of hidden back here. Um, but remember, humans are synapsids. We have a fenestra. It's right here. 
okay? And actually our muscle from our jaw goes through that fenestra. All right, so we, um, we're going to be going over amniotes, but first let's talk about reptilia and then we'll talk about mammalia. So reptilia includes turtles, snakes, crocodiles, and birds. So first let's just talk about reptiles. Oof, that's not right. Uh, well, we'll get back to that. Okay, reptiles. Um, their skin has scales. Um, they are completely independent from the water. Some of them have moved back into the water, but they are not tied to the water because they can lay their eggs on dry land. They fill all kinds of different niches, all kinds of different sizes, very large, very small. Um, but they all uh, reproduce sexually. They have rep uh, sexual reproduction, except some of these vertebrates can actually undergo parthenogenesis during stressful situations and they don't find a mate. They can actually reproduce on their own. It is still going to create genetically unique offspring, though. They're not going to be clones. They are dependent on their environment for temperature, but they are found everywhere in the world except for the Arctic. So they're found in very different, uh, varied climates, just not in Antarctica. All right, squamata includes lizards and snakes. This is your most diverse group. Many of them are venomous, but not all of them. And there are varied adaptations. So here we can see some very colorful lizards and snakes. Um, here we have one with this big um, uh, warning sign. They use that to scare away predators and make predators think they're much bigger than they are. Um, here is an interesting uh, adaptation of the horned lizard. It can actually increase its blood pressure in its eye and squirt blood out of its eye, scaring away predators, or at least giving it enough time to get away. So very interesting. Chameleons here can change colors, much like cephalopods or octopus do. They don't really change color for camouflage like octopus do. They're going to more change color due to their state or emotion. If they're scared or threatened, they'll turn this yellow color. If they're calm, they will turn green, um, and they can even get into some reds and blues depending on the species. Uh, the mechanism in which they um, change color is interesting. Their skin has little crystals inside of it, and they can kind of tense up their skin, which squeezes on or realigns the crystal in different orientations, causing it to color change. All right. Uh, test students, I'm sorry that my PowerPoint is broken. I'm too far in. I cannot start over. But the test students are turtles. Um, and they have a ventral surface of their shell, which is their stomach surface, called a plastron, but their dorsal surface is called a carapace, and it's actually modified uh, ribs. Just remember that a turtle is its shell. It doesn't grow its shell on its back like the mollusks do. It is its shell. These are modified ribs. So a turtle does not live inside of its shell. It is its shell. And here you can see its little tail. Um, here is an image of the modification of the turtle shell here. Early turtles would have these rib-like structures, these plate-like ribs, and then as those ribs kept growing and um, fu they fused together to create the carapace that we recognize today. Um, crocodilia are going to be your crocs and gators. They have been relatively unchanged for 100 million years. We find their fossils about 94 million years ago. And this includes gators, alligators, and caimans. So here we can see another little picture of the caiman versus the alligator versus the crocodile. And they have kind of different mouth, uh, mouth plans, but they all have sharp cone-shaped teeth. Um, and this is the first time that we see the evolution of unidirectional airflow. That's what this says right here. I'm sorry. Unidirectional airflow, meaning that whether they are breathing in inspiration or breathing out expiration, the air moves over their capillaries in the same direction or over their absorbing lungs. This is something that they share with birds and um, dinosaurs, that unidirectional airflow. 
All right, speaking of dinosaurs, these were the dominant vertebrate until about 65 million years ago when most dinosaurs went extinct except for the avian dinosaurs. The avian dinosaurs evolved into birds. So when you eat dino chicken nuggets, it's pretty literal. You're eating dino nuggets. Um, they possibly could have been endothermic, and we think that because while gators are exothermic, um, the birds are endothermic. So it's possible that dinosaurs could have been endothermic and we do find their fossils all over the place. Um, so here we can see a picture of some dinosaurs, an artist rendition of dinosaurs. You can see this megafauna of these giant insects. Here you can see the coelocanth. Here's a, a turtle or a testudin, um, a shark. Uh, and here we can see a cycad tree, which I think is really interesting because that's that's age appropriate. We would see cycads. I'm not sure if we would see the angiosperms develop that much yet, but angiosperms did develop during the Cretaceous period to attract insects. So, you know, all the pieces are there. Uh, we see a pterodactyl in the background. These were not avian dinosaurs. This is probably more what an avian dinosaur looked like, um, but possibly feathered. Here we have another artist's rendition. Um, you can see all of these different types of organisms, but I have a problem with this one because we would not normally see these types of dinosaurs with a T-Rex in the same location. They got it right with the conifer trees. Conifer trees and cycads and ferns even were very common in this time period, but we would not see a T-Rex with an Apatosaurus. It just wouldn't happen because even though they lived in the same areas, um, they lived in completely different time periods. Now we can find dinosaur fossils all over the earth, um, even in North America, um, but they lived in different times. So here we have the Apatosaurus um, and the Brachiosaurus. Okay, these animals were alive during the Jurassic period. So Jurassic Park, yes, the Apatosaurus would be there, but Jurassic Park did you a disservice because they made you believe that the T-Rex was alive during the Jurassic period and it wasn't. It was alive during the late Cretaceous period. So we really would not see those two animals together. You maybe could see a T-Rex and a Triceratops, but they are both from the Cretaceous period, whereas the Brachiosaurus and the Apatosaurus, which are also very popular um, uh, dinosaurs, were only alive during the Jurassic period. So you also would not see the Stegosaurus. You could see the Stegosaurus with the um, Apatosaurus, but you wouldn't see it with the T-Rex. So some of these renditions you have to keep in mind, this was hundreds of millions of years apart. This is 200 million years ago, and this is 100 million years ago. So they lived 100 million years apart. They would not have um, intersected with each other. But here we can see your other types of dinosaurs that we all know and love, um, like the Velociraptor and the uh, Parasophilus, Parasophilus, that's my daughter's favorite one. All right, now the, uh, the important thing here is that dinosaurs or the avian dinosaurs we knew had feathers. Here is a very famous fossil. You can see its feathers. It looks very avian. It has these avian um, appendages here, which look very unique compared to, say, a T-Rex that has claws, okay? Um, the avian dinosaur had specific bird-like wings. This is called the Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx. The Archaeopteryx is the fossil that leads us to believe that birds evolved from the avian dinosaurs because of its feathers. So that leads us to aves or birds. Their skin is covered in feathers, which are modified scales. Um, their wings are modified forelimbs, but they're modified specifically to be wings. So unlike the bat, for instance, that has five digits, they only have two digits. Um, they do still have the unidirectional breathing and their bones are very lightweight and hollow and even some of those uh, lung sacs go down into their larger bones so their bones can actually be important for breathing as well. 
all birds uh, express sexual reproduction. I don't know of any case of parthenogenesis with birds, uh, like in reptiles. And their eggs usually have a hard shell, whereas reptile eggs are soft and leathery. These are going to be hard shell eggs that are fertilized internally. They do have a four chambered heart. And what's really interesting is they are endothermic or warm blooded. They have an extremely high metabolism because flight is usually very expensive. It uses a lot of energy and they live all over the world, even the Arctic, because they have that high metabolism, they can afford to live in colder places because they can regulate their own body temperature. Birds have ex uh, extreme modifications to their beaks and feet and even wings, depending on the environment they live in. For instance, penguins have more flipper like wings to help with swimming. Um, many of these beaks are specialized for their diet um, and as well as uh, their claws. They can be specialized for grasping like an eagle or swimming like a pelican. Um, they also have something called a keel-like sternum. Their sternum or their breastbone sticks out like a keel. And this may seem really weird until you realize that they do a lot of flapping, which means they need to have really strong muscles. And their muscles need something to attach to. So they attach to this keel. And when they're flapping their wings down, this strong muscle, the downstroke muscle, is um, contracting and then when they're flapping their wings up the upstroke this smaller muscle is contracting and this one is relaxed so that keel is very important because it's the attachment of not just one but two groups of muscles um, and now my favorite part to talk about is bird lungs. Bird lungs are super interesting. They're very similar to um, crocodile lungs with that unidirectional airflow, but even more specialized. They have different air sacs. And again, it doesn't matter whether the bird is breathing in or breathing out. In both inspiration and expiration, the airflow over their lungs is going to be unidirectional. So they're always going to have a constant flow of air as opposed to humans where we breathe in and then we breathe out called tidal flow. So we can't constantly be breathing. Whereas it doesn't matter whether we're breathing in or out, the bird will have unidirectional airflow over its bronchi or the parabronchi. So here we can see inspiration and expiration is filling these auxiliary air sacs. So there's always flow in one direction over the parabronchi, kind of how a bagpipe, when you squeeze a bagpipe, um, you can make a constant sound. And here you can see these um, lungs compared with dinosaur lungs. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about mammalia or mammals, and you and I belong to the group mammalia. All mammals have a hair of some kind at some point in their life cycle. Um, even dolphins, which you don't normally think of as hairy, they have some small hairs during um, their juvenile stages, during their youth, that they then lose later on. But most mammals have lots of hair. Um, they are going to have a specialized teeth and skull, which we can predict their diet. So you can just look at the skull of a mammal and kind of know whether it's prey or predator, um, kind of know what it's eating. They do all have mammary glands and they're going to use the mammary glands to secrete milk to feed their young. So they're going to care for their young. All of these mammals are caring for their young past birth. They are all endothermic and they reproduce sexually with internal fertilization. There are three main types of mammals. Eutherians. Eutherians are placental mammals like you and I. Horses, dogs, um, these are all eutherians. They have internal pregnancy, internal gestation. Whereas marsupials have pouch gestation. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then last, they have the monotremes, which actually do lay eggs. So they don't give live birth. They do lay eggs. But they're still considered mammals because they have mammary glands and hair. Um, so here we can see the different types of teeth of 
all mammals. Here, the dolphin has homodont teeth, much like the crocodilian. They're cone-shaped, and they're all um, the same, whereas most mammals, they're going to have molars, premolars, incisors, and canines. You notice in an omnivore that we have different uh, types of teeth. We have crushing teeth, sharp biting teeth, and canines, whereas a carnivore has really distinct canines and biting teeth, and then these premolars are very sharp. Whereas an herbivore all but doesn't have canines, and then they have very sharp front teeth for cutting, like cutting grass, and then grinding molars. So you can tell a lot about an animal just by looking at its teeth. Marsupials are very interesting and diverse, but most marsupials alive today live in Australia. Not all, though. Marsupials actually developed and evolved in South America and later moved to um, Australia. And we assume that because the Dromosios, Dromosios mouse here is very, very similar to the Australian marsupials in its developmental stages. Whereas other, the South American um, possum and the North American possum are a little bit different. Um, let's talk about the Australian marsupials though. They're very, very interesting. So I mentioned that ethereals are true placentals and marsupials have pouch, um, pouch birth. So placentals and eutherians both go through conception due to copulation. And what's interesting is many marsupials can actually go through stasis at this point. They can kind of just hold on to the egg in one of their two uteri. Um, until conditions are right. And then they will birth that egg through their central vaginal canal um, into directly into their pouch for most marsupials. Some marsupials do not, but this is a unique structure that allows them to give birth into their pouch. So they have a very, very short true gestation period inside of their uteri unless it goes into stasis, which means the egg does not develop. They're just kind of holding on to it. Um, then the marsupial will go through the exact same developmental stages as a placental would go through in a pregnancy, an internal pregnancy. Their stages are lactation one and lactation two, though. This is where the um, small, uh, very small, uh, I guess, it's not a zygote, uh, an embryo. It's very, very, very underdeveloped baby will crawl out of the central vaginal canal and attach to a teat and it essentially permanently fuses with that teat and will drink milk until it gets to the lactation two or three stage. Uh, by the time we're in lactation three, it's very similar to the lactation stage of eutherians where the baby is free, free living, can go in and out of the pouch as it pleases and go back in to, for shelter, comfort, and to drink milk. But these two stages, are lactation one and lactation two, are similar to what placentals will go through during their pregnancy. Now here we can see a big difference between marsupial reproductive system and the eutherian reproductive system. Eutherians will have one uterus eye with two oviducts connected to their ovaries and you notice that their bladder these ureters of their bladder are independent so they have one vaginal canal whereas marsupials their ureters actually go through these openings in their vaginal canal meaning that they have a two-pronged vagina and many marsupials will also have a two-pronged penis. But this central canal is only the birth canal. It's not for copulation. It's just for birth into the pouch. And then they have what's similar to a cloaca, a urogenital uh, sinus that opens up because they also have their intestines empty into this urogenital sinus. So it's kind of a one one. Thing. Um, so I find um, these marsupials to be extremely interesting, but almost not as interesting as monotremes. Monotremes are extremely interesting in that they are egg-laying mammals. Here you can see a young joey inside of the pouch. The pouch is not furry. It is actually skin. And here you can see the teat of the mammary gland, and the joey is still attached to that teat. And he will remain attached to that teat until he reaches that third lactation stage. 
All right, now monotremes, egg-laying mammals. Very, very interesting. They lay small leathery eggs. They have hair. Um, this pretty much is just the platypus and the echidna. Um, and they have almost a bill, um, so a leathery bill. Now, interesting that the platypus actually glows green underneath a UV light, which makes this guy make a lot more sense. I always wondered why he was green. Um, but there is some interesting things about the timeline of when Perry the platypus came out and when we discovered that they glow green, which is actually pretty recent. So Perry the platypus predicted that platypi were green, and we didn't know that at the time. Now, platypus can actually be venomous. They have a venom sac on their foot of the adult male. So the adult male is the only one that has the venom sac. Here are the very small, round, and leathery eggs. Platypi do not have a pouch, but echidnas do have a pouch. And here you can see their mammary glands. Um, and then this is their urogenital opening for the babies to be birthed directly into their pouch or the eggs to be laid directly into their pouch for the monotremes. All right, last but not least, the primates. Primates includes lemurs, monkeys, apes, and humans. Prosimians are lemurs and bush babies. Then we have our old world monkey. Old world just means Africa and Asia. This includes apes, which do not have a tail, whereas prosimians and new world monkeys will have tails. Uh, apes are gorillas, orangutans, and chimps, which are our closest cousin, okay? We're not evolved from chimps. They evolved separately from us from a possible common ancestor. And then us, of course, we narcissistically named ourselves Homo sapiens. We are the only smart ones. And then new world monkeys include tamarins, marmosets, and spider monkeys found in South America. Look at this guy. Uh, look at those teeth, man. That is crazy. Uh, this is a, um, a, a baboon and they can be very, very aggressive. So if we know what we know about mammal teeth, I uh, take a gander to guess that he is using these to tear into some enemy flesh. All right, so we can see monkeys all over the world or um, primates all over the world. We have chimpanzees, gorillas in Africa. We have the old world monkeys in Asia and then the new world monkeys mainly in South America. Um, old world monkeys include, like I mentioned, the apes, uh, the macaque, and the gibbons. Then the new world monkeys includes the marmosets, uh, tamarins, spider monkeys, and squirrel monkeys. Um, but the prosimians, prosimians are going to be your lemurs, and they're pretty much just found on Madagascar. Um, uh, primates have a modification of their feet for climbing and grasping. So their feet are going to have this opposable thumb for climbing and grasping. Um, except for humans who have really developed their feet more for walking upright. And so they have lost that opposable digit there. Um, primates also have a prehensile tail or many of them have a prehensile tail to help with balancing and grasping depending on how they move. So some of them move branch to branch and they need to grab. Some of them walk and jump and so they have modifications for those behaviors. That concludes 5.4. If you would like to learn further, you can click on one of these images to uh, explore a virtual dissection of these different types of animals. But don't forget your chapter laboratory write-up for this week. Um, the optional homework is there for extra credit. And don't forget your required chapter quiz, which is located in Blackboard. Thank you so much for joining me this week, and I will see you next week for Unit 7.